In today's show, we're looking at the Phoenix Suns and their regular season, Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and we are available on all platforms. We are here today to talk about the Phoenix Suns, obviously a disappointing end to their season. We're going to talk about what happened there. Hey, if you are watching this on YouTube, drop a comment below. What do you think the Suns should do? Should they move on from Chris Paul? Should they mini rebuild? Should they just bring DeAndre Ayton back at a max? Match any offer? What do you think they should do? Drop it down in the comments below. That would be sick. All right, so let's talk about where this Suns team was. Obviously, they're the best team in the NBA in the regular season. 64 and 18. Just miles ahead of everybody else. And then... They go down after being up in round two of the playoffs to the Mavericks in seven games with an abysmal game seven performance. They had the fourth best offense and the third best defense in the league. They were awesome. They're the coach of the year in Monty Williams. They were just unbelievably good basically all season and it didn't matter. Now, I posed that question at the start of the show and what they should do. Like, I don't think we should overreact. It was a bad loss. It was a terrible loss. It was a bad performance. Horrible performance. And the stuff with Aiton is troubling in terms of him not playing, f- friction in the locker room between him and the coach and all that sort of stuff. It's bad, right? You may be issues with Chris Paul. Who knows? But how hard is it to get a team this good? The answer is it's bloody impossible. Like, it's not... You can't get a team this good. So you can't be like, ah, yeah, all right, didn't work out. Let's let's try a different path. Let's move on. Let's get other guys. Like this is it. This is your chance. It's here in the next two years. Because you know, if Chris Paul retires and Deion Ayton goes, like that, you know, campaign and Bismack Biombo aren't getting you there. Devin Booker's not carrying those blokes. It's not happening. So it's tough for them, for sure. They're in a really tough spot. But this is it. This is your chance. Maybe next year is your chance, and that's it. So that's going to be really interesting to see exactly how they um, how they go about that and what does happen with Aiden, who now probably profiles as the most interesting free agent heading into next season. He is a restricted free agent, of course. They've also got Aaron Holiday as a restricted free agent, who was okay, I guess. Wouldn't be prioritizing him massively, but he was okay. They've got Ish Wainwright and Gabriel Lundberg, who came across at the end of the year. Uh, they're restricted guys as well. And they've got Alfred Payton, Bismack Biombo, and JaVale McGee as unrestricted guys. I, I thought what Biombo did, even to a degree McGee did, you have to have some faith in bringing those guys back as second and third centers. But remember, they get Dario Saric back next season. Um, they maybe get Frank Kaminsky back. Well, they should get Frank Kaminsky back. He's under contract, so don't know why he wouldn't be back. So is there enough playing time or enough roster spots to have... Oh, no, uh, Kaminsky's not, sorry. He was uh, he was waived, wasn't he? That's right. So they don't have all those um, you know, roster spots available for all those centers necessarily. So it'll be interesting to see what they do there. But Biombo definitely has a spot in the league somewhere um, as a backup or third string center. He was pretty impressive given those opportunities that he did get. The Suns at the moment have zero draft picks. Their first rounder went to the Thunder in the Chris Paul deal. And their second round pick, pick 60, went to the Pacers in the Tory Craig Jalen Smith deal. So no trades coming up there for the old Phoenix Suns. But that gives me an opportunity to tell you about Prize Picks. Are you looking for a daily fantasy option for the NBA? Then you need to know about the award-winning app Prize Picks. It's easy to use. What you do is you pick two or five play, two to five players in a lineup, and you go over under on their projection. That's it. There'll be a number for their points, their rebounds, their assists, their steals, their blocks. You look at it and you go over under. That's it. Combine them together and you can win up to 10 times your entry fee. Is that easy? Safe and fast withdrawals as well. And you can use it on the app or you can use it on the website. Very, very straightforward. It's not just basketball though. 
You can do multi-sports entries with other sports like baseball, when football season starts, uh, college sports, soccer, all of those things can, can be combined into one entry. And for a limited time, Price Picks has an exclusive no-brainer of an offer for all users. You get 50 bucks for free if a player in your first Price Picks entry scores a single point. Single point. Be good to use the code NBA. That's right. It's an exclusive offer available to Locked On fans. Sign up today and use code NBA. 50 bucks for free if a player in your first Price Picks entry scores a single point. Price Picks is daily fantasy made easy. We all know that eating healthy is super important. I don't think that's... Is that, is that a surprise? Shouldn't be to anyone. And it's sometimes it could be hard to do. So feeling your best, it starts with what you eat. And getting that food is tough. Sakara is a wellness company anchored in food as medicine on a mission to nourish your body through the power of plants. Sakara gives you the tools you need to transform your life with their organic, ready-to-eat meal delivery program and functional wellness essentials. Sakara's functional plant-rich wellness essentials help you create the body that you love living in. From, your, from the best-selling metabolism super powders to the foundation, their daily supplement packs, Sakara's products are designed to support your wellness goals anytime, anywhere. Full of plant-rich ingredients, Sakara is offering our listeners 20% off their first order when they go to sakara.com slash locked on 20 or enter the code locked on 20 at checkout. That's Sakara, S-A-K-A-R-A dot com slash locked on 20 to get 20% off your first order, sakara.com slash locked on 20. Let's talk players. Let's talk Chrissy Paul, who, again, was able to stay remarkably healthy in the regular season. What's that, three years in a row after being injury prone and you can't trust him and all this stuff? He's 37. He was great. 18th ranked player, best fantasy player for this team. 14.7 points only. Only one three. Like, they're not, not, it's not the great start of a line, is it? 4.4 rebounds, 10.8 assists, 1.9 steals. So there's the value, isn't it? It's assists and it's steals. He also was 49% from the field and 84 from the line. Hitting just 32% from three. He, he was a bit of a worry to begin the year. Assists were down. The shots weren't falling. The threes still never really fa- uh, ended up falling. But those numbers are great. I is no way that I'm taking Chris Paul in round two. He's going to be 37 and a half, basically. Um, th- that line... That ranking, that second round value is dependent almost entirely on the fact that he averaged two steals. If that 14, 4, and 11 stays, but it goes to 1.4 steals, you're talking about a 40th ranked player. If 49% shooting on the back of 56% from two goes to 47, then it's a top 60 player. That's just the the, the case. Now, he's not going to have a remarkable increase in minutes from 33, He's not going to probably play. He only played 65 games. Who knows if he plays more than that. Um, and the only way to go from here for Paul is down, I think. He was still really impactful. Like, big, big Raptor number. Um, like, one of the top players on this team. Third, in fact, out of the regular minutes players. Led the team in EPM, 97th percentile across the NBA. You know, really above average true shooting. Above average E field goal percentage. Finish at the rim, one of the best mid-range shooters in the NBA. We know that. Led the team in LeBron. He was unbelievable through all these metrics. His on-off stuff was a plus 5.3. Not the best on the team, but still pretty bloody good. But there's no way. There's no way you take him in round two. You maybe do it round three. I don't I don't trust it. I know I know he's a good steals guy. I know that. But at 37 and a half, the, you know, if 11 and 2 assists and steals goes to nine and one and a half it's not third round it simply isn't and that's the way I think you've got to look at it let's look at Devin Booker who averaged 26.8 points 2.7 triples in 35 minutes he played 68 games he's still only 25 Booker he's got a super max decision coming up here uh or him and the Suns so let's see what they do there 4.8 assists 1.1 steals 47 87 Shot 38 from three, true shooting of 58%. 20th ranked player in category leagues. Um, 20th first in points leagues, averaging 42. That's who he is, right? A top 20 second round player. Yeah, 27, five and five. There's no realistic reason why that shouldn't continue. The only thing I would say is that if Chris Paul does get marginalized, then Booker's five assists go to six. Well, not marginalized, but... Yeah, over the next couple of years, Paul will obviously drop away. 
Yeah, the five is so Booker can be like we're sitting him here at this eighteen to twenty five range. In two years' time, I think he, yeah, he's going to be twenty seven age, and you'd be looking at the top twelve player. So there's still a little bit there of upside in dynasty because yeah, it's just twenty seven five five turns into twenty seven five seven, twenty seven five six. And that's that's the step forward you get, or I think anyway. Um, led this team. In Raptor, defensively, he used to be a terrible defender. He's not terrible at all. He's thoroughly average. Really high number in EPM as well. Good E field goal, good true shooting, good mid-range shooter as well. Him and Chris Paul really working well there together. He's LeBron is great. Like everything, everything about what we saw from Booker is translated into all the advanced stats. Plus four point eight on off. It's about the same as Paul. It's about the same as Crowder. These have all got around five, that five mark. There's one player in the starting lineup who had a uh, an on-off that was pretty significantly higher than everyone else. We'll talk about him in a sec. But just really good stuff, again, from Devin Booker, who has maintained strong value. I think last season, I'm going to double-check this. I think last season, his numbers did fall away with Chris Paul there. Somewhat, where he wasn't a top 20 player. He had an ADP of 24, so he did beat that number. And again, I, I do think that there is, you know, I, I wouldn't let him get past 20 most likely in drafts because I think there is that little assist upside if there is a scaling back of if Chris Paul plays 30 instead of 33 and that does help Booker overall and he was able to coexist pretty comfortably with him this year so yeah, last season he was 47th what's the difference between Booker this year and last year um, rebounds and assists jumped up steals jumped up now that maybe that's the regression because he's never been a guy who's averaged a steal a game before 0.8 up to 1.1 that's a big difference um, so that's probably the big, the big thing. But also, he had a year where he shot 92 from the line. He's sort of 86, 87 is about right for him. But just remember, there is a chance that he can push that um, just a little bit higher. Let's talk DeAndre Aiden because he had some really good moments in the playoffs and then just some disgusting, disgustingly bad moments, which are soured by the reports of, you know, disharmony between him and Monty Williams and refusal to go into games, which you refuse to go into the game uh, I don't really care what else happens. Now, maybe I'm off base on this, but if you refuse to go into a game, you're a fucking idiot. Simple as that. You can argue with the coach, I want more touches, I want more... Whatever. But if you, you go, you're there to play, you go into the game. If that's actually what happened, that's speculation. I don't know if that's been confirmed. But if you're asked to go into the game and you don't go in, you're a fucking idiot. And honestly, I know, as I said before, this is the chance of the team getting... Um, and getting a title. But the doubt has to be there. If someone's going to act like that, you want to go, oh, it's all good, man. He's 27 million a year for four or five years. I'd be like, see you later. Bye. I'd be inclined to do it just because of that one thing. And I know that seems petty, but it's bullshit when you're trying to build a team. So, with all that said, Aiton still didn't play 30 minutes a night. And people can talk as much as they want about, oh, yeah, but they got to the finals. It was still the right pick, that number one, they needed him. It was still a disaster of a pick to pick him at number one over Doncic, and I don't care what anyone says. It, it was a disaster. This bloke still can't play 30 minutes a night as the number one overall pick. He's solid, and he's improved, and he's much better than I thought he would be. I still wouldn't pick him top two in that draft, or top three in that draft, probably. 17 and 10. Still hasn't shown an ability to take threes. Still hasn't shown an ability to get to the line. Average 0.7 blocks. They're all putrid numbers. 44th ranked fantasy player. Yeah, the 63 and 75 is a great percentage combo. It's great. And there is, if he goes to another team, which again, I think is a huge possibility, he'll probably be a top 20 fantasy guy because he'll play 33 minutes. He'll average 20 and 12. He'll do it on elite efficiency. He might eventually get to the line at some point. And maybe he tries a little bit and blocks some shots. There's still there's massive upside here as a fantasy player. As a real-life winning contributor, I'm not sure about that. But as a fantasy player, yeah. He was 56th in points leagues and 44th in category leagues. Again, I don't think I'd hesitate to take him in the third round if he's on another team. If he's on the Suns, fourth or fifth round has to be it. Has to be. Because he's just they just haven't shown any... Um, willingness to push his minutes higher over four years. And he is literally not, for his on-call play, he is not worth a max contract. Other factors are into it. Investment uh, with the first pick, with 
replaceability with potential growth. All that stuff is is true. But do you want to do it? Hmm. We will find out, won't we? Um, Rock Auto. What parts for your car, man? I know you're all... You know the story. You go, you, you drive past a local chain's part. I've had people tell me. They drive past a local chain auto parts store. They stick their head out the window, give them a thumbs down and start booing. That's probably going a little bit too far. But getting the parts that you want from your car, there's never been a simpler opportunity or a simpler option. And that's going straight to Rock Auto. Rock Auto is an online family business serving auto parts customers for over 20 years. Why would you spend 30, 50, 100% more for the same parts for your car, whether that part's a brake part, a tail lamp, a motor oil, or even new carpets. Rock Auto has everything you would need for your car or truck. So head across to rockauto.com right now and see all those parts that are available for your car or truck. And then their How Did You Hear About Us box right locked on so that they know that we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. Let's talk Mikhail Bridges, who probably was a little bit disappointing from a fantasy point of view this season. Still was excellent and yeah, top three defensive player of the year. But the overall line, it's a little bit off. It's not great. 14, 4, and 2. Just 1.4 threes, 1.2 steals, and 0.4 blocks. Now, the efficiency is unbelievable. 53 from the field, 83 from the line. True shooting of 63. He hit 63% of his twos as well. Like, these are just insane numbers. But part of the appeal of Bridges as a potential top 50 player in the past has been... He'll get big steals and good out-of-position blocks. And without those, he was 78th. Now, there are going to be people who tell you that Mikhail Bridges is not the 78th ranked player because they'll say he played all 82 games, Josh. And I know that's true. But you know my thoughts on, on this is that, that that doesn't predict a fluke injury in the future. It just doesn't. It doesn't guarantee you play 82 the next year. It doesn't. I guarantee you that as well. There's no guarantee of those things happening because he did it in one or two seasons. I also refuse to believe that you want a bloke averaging 14-4-2 as a top 30 player because he doesn't turn the ball over. And again, you have to be really careful the way that you're looking at, um, at values of players. So if I look at nine cat value, including turnovers, and look at totals instead of per game for Mikhail Bridges, he's the 24th ranked player. Now, I guarantee you, if you draft Mikhail Bridges at 24, your team will suck. It will suck. And that is why having all those things in your mind is super important. Now, if I go to per game value, he jumps up to 53rd. That's including turnovers. It's, look, 14, one, 4, and 2 with 1.2 steals. It is not, like, the, what's he even doing there? What category is Mikhail Bridges outside of percentages? Where is he above average? The answer is he's above average marginally in field goals, marginally in free throws, and marginally in steals. Doesn't have a Z score of over one in any category. And I don't want to waste a, an early fifth round pick on a guy like that usually. Now, if the steals go back to 1.7, 1.8, then yeah, we're talking a lot better, right? And on a different team where he's asked to do more and he can very easily do more, the value for him is fantastic. But we're not at that spot, are we? And that's just not where he is. So a lot has to change for me to get excited in investing a top 50 pick in someone like Mikhail Bridges. Let's, let's look at Cam Johnson, who I think we'd have to assume is in line to become a starter on this team at some point. He was in my sixth man of the year. I think I actually picked him for sixth man of the year just because of the impact he was able to have offensively and defensively. But when we got to the playoffs, defensively, he sucked. And he is a guy that I think gets overrated fantasy-wise as well. He did have some little stretches when a couple of players were injured. And that, that bodes well for him. Now, I think it was when Booker was out and Crowder was out. He'd stepped up. He'd be a 20-point-per-game guy. But doesn't have an ability. One of those guys, again, doesn't have an ability to produce when you're not getting outsized usage. He ended up averaging 12 points with four rebounds, one and a half assists, and 0.9 steals. Like, this is the problem. Four, one and a half, point nine, point two. They're piss poor numbers. Yes, he can score. 12 points in 26 minutes, two and a half threes. True shooting, 63. Like, very efficient. 43% shooter. Excellent stuff. The value is coming from the threes. But it needs volume. You need to pump the volume in there to get, get him up. 
Now, Crowder is, of course, getting older. He's 32. Johnson's 26. He's getting older as well, as we all are. But Johnson's already old for a young player. He's 26. Um, you know, what, what can he ever become, I think, is what I'd like to know. Can he be a 32-minute-a-night player? I, I think he can be. But if, the, say, it's the same team where it's Paul Booker, Bridges, Aiton, how many shots does he get in that starting lineup? Is it enough to actually matter? Is it enough to push him to be a top 80 player? Well, he's 126th in 26 minutes. So maybe he's top 100. He can average 15 at three threes with nothing else. Rebounding, he is better at than I'm maybe giving him credit. You know what I didn't do, though, which I should have spoken about the advanced stats for Aiton and Bridges. Don't know why I didn't do that. Aiton's pretty miserable in Elise Raptor. Actually, that, uh, that's a miscalculation or mischaracterization. Pretty miserable in Raptor, but his EPM was high, but he was low in LeBron as well. Bridges, solid across the board. I think part of the reason I didn't really speak about it is there's nothing that really stands out with those guys. The worry I, get, I have a little bit with Bridges is he finished at the rim at 77%. That's 99th percentile in the NBA. A fall off there really drops his efficiency. If we look at Cam Johnson, actually Bridges was the guy who had the highest on off on this team as well, plus 9.5. Cam Johnson was actually a negative 1.5 on court. And a lot of that is because he's playing with bench units, but that's worth looking at. His Raptor, though, was higher than Bridges. It was higher than Aiton. It was higher than Crowder. His EPM was about was actually identical to Crowder's. His LeBron was solid, but not as good as Crowder. So he sort of looked okay. I don't, yeah, I, I don't really buy him as a long-term fantasy star player that just needs a starting role. It needs a starting role, it needs a worse team, and it needs significant improvements in multiple areas. The efficiency he's already got done. All right, It needs big usage, and then what else are you going to give me? Seven rebounds? 1.2 steals? Is that ever going to come? I, I don't know. I don't feel confident in saying that. He averaged 22 fantasy points, 171st in those as well. Jay Crowder. Spoke about him, yeah, you know, sort of t- tangentially already. And sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. 9.4 points, 1.93s, 5 boards, 2 assists, 1.4 steals, 0.4 blocks, shot under 40% from the field and 79 from the line, including 35% from 3. He was 130th in category leagues. He was 145th in points leagues. And I don't think you want any anything to do with drafting him in 12-team formats. Like, 130th, yes, 156 players are rostered at minimum. But why would you bother drafting someone when there's just no upside for me to be better than that? Use him. Use him in the playoffs. Punt field goals. All that stuff's fine. What's he actually giving you that's good? Steals? Yes. But, like, what else? Like, some threes. He's really a steal specialist at this point. And I don't see how that's going to change in the future. Already sort of tangentially referenced him as well with his uh, advanced numbers. He was pretty solid across most of them, as most of these Sun starters were, because you know, that's part of the value of being on a team that's this good, is that you get carried a little bit by some of those performances. And he was a plus 5.4 on off, you know, compared to Johnson as a negative 1.5. Like, he's still useful enough defensively, but getting older, 32, the shot's off. He had that really hot run in the bubble, but he's just not a good shooter. And yeah, fantasy wise, it's just really about steals for old uh, old mate. What's his name? Uh, Jay Crowder. Let's look at Javale McGee, who had moments for sure. And you can see, like playing for sixteen minutes a night, one hundred seventy first ranked fantasy player, one hundred eighty seventh in points leagues. He averaged nine and seven, one block, sixty three and seventy percent. That's the value. Really, is getting that uh, really high field goal percentage for Javale. Blocks were good too. Stepped up when Aiton was out. Played some good numbers. But then Biombo came in and, and cut into that a bit. So what they do with him, what they do with Biombo, is still a big question mark to me. He was a minus 4.8 in his time on court. His advanced stuff is pretty solid, but I think you know, some of the defensive stuff gets a bit overrated because of his blocks. But his numbers come out all pretty well. But JaVale McGee is 34. I don't, yeah, he's never going to be a starter or anything like that. He's always going to be a plug-and-play sort of player, and he was pretty solid in that role. Campaign was interesting this year. 
He was 182nd in category leagues. Probably should bring his little um, screen across. 157th in points leagues, averaging 23. Didn't shoot the ball well. Averaged 11, 3, and 5. 0.7 steals, 41 and 84. 1.2 triples, shot 34% from three. Just didn't shoot the ball very well at all. He had some moments in the past of shooting well, but it just didn't happen. But we saw when Chris Paul went down, Cameron Payne stepped up and was an absolute must-roster guy and would have powered plenty of teams in the fantasy playoffs. And we've said that for the last three years, is that campaign, if Chris Paul goes down, he's going to be a must-roster. It happened, he was. But that's what he is, as a backup point guard. His advanced numbers weren't horrible. They were still pretty good. He was above average in most categories. The problem is his shooting was just so bad. 52 shooting and 47 E field goal percentage are really bad numbers. But I thought he was really solid um, in that backup role. Had moments where he, he struggled at times. But significantly better than, say, Landry Shamit. Significantly better than Aaron Holiday. And should be sticking around in that role, I would imagine, for a little bit of time as we move forward. Tory Craig. I, yeah, not much to talk about here. Six points, a three. 279th in category leagues. Four rebounds, 0.6 deals. Is he actually a rotation player still? He's 31. Not really. I, I don't really think there's any sort of long-term value in him. In fact, most of these guys we're going to talk about here, there's not a lot to talk about. But Aaron Holiday is worth mentioning because he's a restricted free agent. He's had opportunities. He went over to the Wizards. He was traded for by the Wizards. He's had opportunities with the Pacers to start. And every time he does it, he doesn't do it, do it well. He had opportunities in Phoenix. Six, one, and two. 0.7 steals, 45 and 87. Should be a solid three-point shooter. And he shot 38%, which is fine. But he's not a knockdown bloke. I don't know. There's just nothing about him that gets me excited. As a restricted guy, I wouldn't be prioritizing bringing him back. Can he be a backup? Like, say Memphis loses Tyus Jones. No problem with him being a backup point guard. But is he actually good enough to be an every-night backup point guard? I'm, I'm actually not convinced. I think the pedigree is there with the name, obviously. And he shows flashes at times. But the overall body of work from Az, is not good enough, I don't think, to be excited about a big step forward. He's also going to be 26 at the start of the season. Landry Shamit is 25. One of the worst fantasy players out there. Eight points, almost two threes. But under two boards, under two assists. Putrid? Put that's putrid and shithouse put together. Um, steals and blocks, 39 and 84. 331st in category leagues. He's had he played 20 minutes. He's had plenty of opportunities. He's just literally like Doug McDermott from a fantasy point of view. He's Tony Snell. He's horrible. It's never going to change. Last guy I'm going to talk about here um, is Bismack Biombo, who again really resurrected what he was able to do. Six points, four point six boards, 0.8 blocks, fifty nine and fifty four. Took last year off, I think it was, to build hospitals back in. I hope I don't get this wrong. Back in the Congo, I believe that's where he's from. Um, and put up. You know, came back and was just very, very strong, I thought, as a defensive center. And as a third-string center, you could do significantly worse than having Bismack Biombo out there. Had opportunities to start at times, and I thought, again, was really good. Biombo is 30. Uh, sorry, sorry, he's 30. Well, that's, what? He's 30? Fuck, no way. All right, so McG McGee's 34, Biombo's 30. Yeah, look, teams need to bring him back. He needs a full-time backup role. He's good enough for that was really impressed. I, I don't know if he's actually 30. Uh, I know there was some debate about his age, but regardless, he's 30. And he moved like he wasn't that old. So he's he's good to go. Back up center. Team should be prioritizing looking at him, I reckon. You don't want to extend him too much, but I thought he was good enough in that role, as long as you're not trying to extend him too much, to be useful. And that, unless you want me to go into talking about Lundberg or Ish Wainwright, who showed a little bit, but Wainwright's 28 already. I don't think he's ever going to be a rotation player or Alfred Payton, who is cooked. Follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app here on YouTube. Thumb it up. Leave your comments down below, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.